All right, everyone, we're going to give it a couple more minutes as if people are logging on to the webinar. And we'll be uh, looking to start right at 2. All right, everyone. So it is about 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen, and today we're going to be going through a basic introduction to MarkForge 3D printing and the general business impacts associated with this 3D printing. And what I really want to focus on today is I want to get down to what exactly 3D printing is, how it's useful, and how to look for opportunities in order to use it within your industry. Because a lot of these presentations, uh, you know, they're focused on specific aspects of the mechanical engineering or uh, on the software. And what I wanna do is I wanna take a step back and get a more broad sense of what the MarkForge portfolio has to offer and why it is uh, the talk of the town, why we're here today to discuss. Uh, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into our agenda. The idea being that we're going to talk about what exactly is MarkForge 3D printing. So the FFF style printing and the Atom style metal printing. What are they? How do they work? How do we access it? And uh, you know, what are their capabilities? Then we're going to move into basically how 3D printing changes business. So what are the business impacts 
how are our customers currently using it? And where can you kind of find that opportunity to work with 3D printing? And that moves into the identifying opportunities. So just what do these people see when they look at your manufacturing floor? What do they see when you know they look at your current workflow, your business? And how do you find what components to replace, what materials to replace, what processes to make better as we go from there? So without further ado, uh, my name is Steven. I'm an application engineer for Solid Experts working out of the Nashua office. And I'm here today to just get you up to date on MarkForce 3D printing and on how 3D printing can help change the current structure of the manufacturing workplace. But before we can get into the details about how it impacts business, let's make sure that our baseline understanding of 3D printing is up to date. So what is MarkForce 3D printing? If you've been around the block for a while, I mean, 3D printing is not new. We've been talking about 3D printing for the last 20, 30 years, and there are a ton of different ways to additively grow a part. So when someone says 3D printing, they could be referring to any of these different technologies uh, thanks to our friends over at 3D Hubs here. And these technologies are what have allowed for this technological boom or for the different methods of fabricating a part in a additive method rather than your conventional subtractive manufacturing. And where we're going to focus today is over here at the FDM FFF style 3D printing. And that's where Mark Forge comes into play. And that's where a lot of the current interest in 3D printing is, is the idea of having fused filament fabrication, which we'll talk about in a minute here, and growing your part layer by layer. And that's going to be really important, is understanding exactly what the 3D printing process looks like uh, for you as you use it and for others, so you know what it costs them in order to create parts. So the 3D printing process itself is very simple. You start out with your CAD model, you create your 3D geometry, then you take that geometry and you put it into a slicer. In Mark Forge case, we use the Iger slicer, but you are able to basically create the coding for that part, which we'll talk about more later on. And then finally, you're going to print your part. So it's really an easy three-step process. Create your model, create your slice of your model, and then you send it to your 3D printer. So let's walk through that process. Let's take this part, um, create it on our 3D modeler, and we're going to go ahead and slice it. And the term slicing is specific to um, manufacturing, to additive manufacturing. So you'll hear it time and time again. And all slicing is doing is it's going in and cutting off pieces, layer by layer of your part, in order to uh, work with or to print on your printer. So the slicer is responsible for orienting your part, selecting what configuration, and dividing it into individual layers and tool paths. So if you start out with this component, a sliced part is going to be those individual layers. Now, for those of you with some machining background, this is very similar to the way that CNC machines require CAM software. And what CAM does is you basically create the pathing for each of your tools in order to remove material. This is a very manual process, takes a decent amount of time, even for a skilled machinist, in order to create your pathing to create your program. And what the Iger software and what slicing inside of 3D printing allows for is a more or less automated process in order to create that equivalent coding to make your part which means that all the engineer or the user has to do is you take your part, you load it into the Iger software, and based on a few settings, kind of like a TurboTax setup, you're going to generate your pathing and geometry. You don't have to do any of the hard work. It's all based off of your geometry. All you have to do is select things like which material you want to use, uh, what thickness you want, and what fibers you want. And it's going to make your part. And that's the basis of fused filament fabrication, is you take that sliced component and you're gonna put it onto your 3D printer. And as you can see here with the print nozzle, it's depositing a layer of material. Then it'll go ahead and step up one segment and deposit another layer of material. So at its basis, we're feeding 
that's thermoplastic material called onyx, which we'll talk about later, through that extruder and through the print head in order to grow your additive part. Now, there's a lot of different companies doing fused filament fabrication. Uh, there's a lot of FDM style printers. They've become very, very popular from everywhere from hobbyists all the way up to, you know, um, industrial designers. But where Mark Forge really shines is their addition of composite filament fabrication. And that's the idea that we have continual strands of fiber within our material, within our parts, in order to add strength. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the difference in adding that reinforcement. And so after the CAD step, when you go ahead and slice your component, you're going to just add on that reinforcement. So you're going to add in this fiber within your part model in order to add that additional strength, and then you'll print it out in the same way as ever. So these components here, for example, these are a Dixon valve special for end of arm effectors. And what they are going to do is they're going to hold this component. And these are actually the grippers that we've been looking at step by step. And the idea is that they want to be able to hold this metal component for however many cycles you need inside of your robotic uh, industrial equipment. So what we need to do is we need to add fiber to the internals of this component. So remember, we have that sliced layer. And we'll go ahead and just look at that from a top view. And rather than just having the base material, we're going to have two materials. So the first material we're going to talk about is the onyx material. Onyx is a thermoplastic material that has chopped carbon fiber in it, making it stronger than your conventional plastics. That yellow that you see around the inside of our part here, that is continuous fiber filament. Now, continuous fiber filament is what makes Mark Forge so special. It gives you an exorbitant amount of strength for very little weight, meaning that you can use Kevlar, fiberglass, carbon fiber in continual strands in order to strengthen your components. So in this case, because we can have a lighter component than you would conventionally have in metal, your cycle times are gonna be faster, you're gonna have wear, less wear on your industrial machinery, and they're going to last longer. They're gonna be impact resistant. And this is what it looks like coming off the printer. So you're looking at a composite part that has both your conventional FDM style thermoplastic material, as well as the composite filament fabrication from Mark Forged. And that's gonna give you a few benefits here. First off is metal strength. The idea is that when you add carbon fiber and some of the other fibers to your uh, Mark Forge component, to your part, you actually get strengths as strong as 6061 aluminum. Uh, so we're not talking a part that kind of just looks cool and someone has sitting on their desk. We're talking about parts that can fundamentally replace metal components with higher strengths than the materials you're currently using. And this leads us into the next benefit, which is the durability of those components. Because you have the ability to control your fiber, you have the ability to control which fiber you're using, you have a better control over your material properties. So if you want something to be impact resistant, if you want it to be able to survive tons of cycles, then you can use, say, Kevlar, which has those specific properties that you want. And then finally, you're optimized for performance, meaning that you're able to go in set how you want to lay your particular fibers in your different layers, and you get to optimize your design for 3D printing. So when we talk about the strength of the material, everyone always asks, you know, how do you compare with ABS or nylon? Well, if you look at the bottom there, that's the comparison where we have the onyx material, uh, which is that, again, black thermoplastic material with the chopped carbon fiber which is already significantly stronger than your standard thermoplastic materials that you're used to working with in 3D printing. But once you add the fibers, we're talking an entirely different category. So with the fiberglass, Kevlar, high strength, high temperature fiberglass and carbon fiber, you're getting parts that are significantly stronger and have different properties. So for example, the carbon fiber is going to give you your best strength to weight ratio. And that's going to create your strongest metal-like parts. 
whereas say high strength, high temperature fiberglass could be used for high temperature applications up to around 300 degrees F. And again, that Kevlar gives you more impact resistance. Uh, it makes it so that your failure mode in your plastic part fails more like a metal rather than like a ceramic. And then fiberglass is your best cost value, meaning that if you want a part to be a little bit stronger than your conventional component, but you don't want to break the bank, fiberglass is a, a great tool for that as well. So that's why Mark Forge technology is different. That's, that's why we're here talking about it today is that we have a depth of materials of uh, you know, meeting your specific applications that allows you to have the creativity to affect your workflow. So we have customers who only use carbon fiber and we have customers who only use Kevlar. Really, whatever the tool is to do your job, that's what we're interested in, in working with here. But you know, sometimes composite parts are not strong enough. There are applications, you know, high temperature, if you need isotropic strength, that you need metal. You need a metal component. And so what we have up next is the Markforce metal printing technology. And that's based off of uh, a process called Atom. And this process, and we're gonna walk through it uh, to, to catch you up to speed, is actually very, very simple. So the idea is that we have a metal powder within a wax and polymer binder so that we can feed it through an extruder and print head, just like FDM style printing, but instead to make metal parts. So in order to make metal parts, we're going to have a slightly elongated process. So you start out with your design, you make your CAD file, you print that out on the Metal X printer. Now you have a part in the green state. From there, we'll take it and wash it. When you wash it, it's gonna remove that, uh, that wax and polymer that's holding it together. And then it becomes a brown part. We'll send it to the sinter, where that's going to fuse your metal together inside the sintering oven in order to end up with your part. And what that looks like uh, down at the powder level here is we have our metal inside of its wax and polymer uh, inside the green state. So this is how it's coming off of your print bed. You run it through the debinding process, which is just a vapor degreaser. It's gonna remove out the wax. And then you're gonna sinter, which is gonna melt off the rest of the polymer and merge your part together. Now, really important to note, there is shrinkage. And what's amazing about the Marford setup is that all of the shrinkage that happens is compensated for inside of the Iger software. So the part that you design, you put into the Iger software at the size that you want it. And Iger is going to oversize your initial component so that when it shrinks, it's going to shrink to your size. Now, the whole process is the idea of you print it, you wash it, you center it, and you have your metal component. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna jump over to Trip and you're gonna get to see the metal in action uh, as you're printing this metal component. Hey everyone, I'm here to talk today about the MarkForge Metal X process. It's a simple, safe, and cost-effective method to go from design to functional metal part. There are three steps in this process, printing, washing, and then sintering. First, let's start with CAD. You design your part, then export to STL, and upload it to Iger. Iger is a cloud-based slicing and print management system that comes with every MarkForge product. This automatically configures your part based on the material and printer you've selected. When your part slices for metal 3D printing, it gets scaled up to account for shrink and deformation in the downstream processes. It then slices your part into discrete layers, identifies overhang features, and builds supports and a raft underneath your part. As we go through printing, washing, and sintering, Iger will monitor the part's progress along the way. Let's start this print and go to the Metal X. Before starting a print, 
the machine automatically maps and levels the bed to ensure the first layer goes down well. Your print is built of two materials stored in this heated chamber above. One of a ceramic release material and one of the metal to be printed. This filament material is metal powder safely suspended within a two-part plastic binder. It gets heated and extruded onto the build plate where the part is created layer by layer. The release material gets extruded as an interface between the part and its supports so that once your part comes out of the furnace, it's easy to remove. Unlike other metal 3D printing systems, this process does not require loose metal powder, resulting in a safer and more cost-efficient workflow. 17.4 stainless steel is loaded now. However, with a quick changeover, the system is capable of printing in stainless steels, tool steels, coppers, inconel, along with several other materials currently in development. Once your part is finished printing, you'll get a notification. At this point, you can go to the printer, remove the part from the build tray, and clear the bed. Now we have what's called a green part. It doesn't really look or feel like metal. However, a large part of it is comprised of metal powder. Next step, we'll be putting it into wash one for the debind process. The wash one removes the first stage of the binding material. A green part is taken from the printer and placed into the wash basket, which is then lowered into the solvent. Wash times will vary, ranging from a few hours to a few days, depending on the thickest region of your part. After that, it's now called a brown part and is ready for sintering. Let's go over to the furnaces. This is Sinter 2, a furnace designed for mid-volume production runs and larger printed parts. Sintering transforms a print from a lightly bound collection of metal powder to a fully finished metal part. First, the temperature ramps slowly to burn away the trace amounts of remaining binding material. Then, temperature ramps closer to the melting point of the material, allowing metal particles to start to fuse together to create a strong metal part. Mark IV sintering furnaces use a carbon-free retort to ensure part quality and alloy composition standards are met for our finished pieces. Each run takes about a day and can be monitored remotely using the Iger software. Once a run is complete, the setter tray full of finished metal pieces can be removed from the furnace. Once removed from the raft, these parts are ready for use. In the furnace, the layer of printed release material between supports and the raft and your printed part remains powderized. This allows the structure to be tacked to the raft to better control shrink and accuracy throughout the process, but also an easy release after sintering. At this stage, your part is fully sintered and ready to be used. It can be post-machined, polished, or otherwise processed as necessary for the final application, but in many uses, the accuracy and strength are good enough as is. It's ready for install. Check out markforge.com for more information about our simple, safe, and cost-effective method of metal additive manufacturing. So one of the main points uh, that Trip pointed out there is that it's safe. So a lot of the conventional metal 3D printing approaches uh, use highly flammable powders, and you need a lot of special equipment, suits, rooms, ventilation in order to work with it. So the Mark Forge process is completely safe and has a wide range of these materials, of these metals. Uh, so as you can see here, if you need a tool steel, we have H13, D2, A2 steels, uh, also copper because of its conductivity is an amazing addition to the material portfolio. And then Inconel 625. So if you're working on a high temperature or high corrosive environment, uh, you know that or 17.4 stainless steel, you have the metals that you're used to working with that you are able to continue to work with but now that they're 3D printed, they can be significantly lighter. And in development, we have titanium and 316L, as well as some others. And what's cool about this process is that most metals, or many, many metals, have the ability to be uh, printed in this manner. So eventually, we're going to add more and more materials to the portfolio that you're able to use inside of your 3D printer. Now, let's see the impact of this though. So we've talked a lot about the engineering side of the 3D printers, just the basics on how they work, what you're looking for, where you're getting the strength. But now let's get into how this 3D printing changes business. So in this case, we want to unlock your manufacturing efficiencies. So by 
working with 3D printing, you're able to improve the speed of production. So you're able to turn around faster when you're making parts, making prototypes, and even making your fixturing. You can reduce downtime. So if a part breaks, then you're reducing the amount of time you spend waiting for that component to ship and you have greater yields. So because you're able to test out your product earlier in the process, you're able to avoid costly mistakes, you're able to avoid bad print runs, and you're able to get your components to your customers much quicker. So in transforming your business, the benefits of 3D printing become very apparent. So you're able to obviously lower your production costs. You're spending less money on individual one-off components on fixturing, and instead you're able to free up your machinist's talent in order to work on the customer components. So they're not spending as much time making your jigs and fixturing, and instead can do value-added tasks such as making component parts and customer-facing parts, which is going to eventually improve your profitability because you have your better people working on your more profitable tasks, you're going to be able to make more money. You're able to also shorten your product development cycle, meaning that if I want to create a component, conventionally I have to create the models, I have to send that out and wait for either another machine shop or my own machine shop to make the part, I get it back a few weeks later, oh, something is wrong, I send it back again, and we repeat the process a few times until we have our final product. With 3D printing, you're able to shorten that development cycle and to iterate faster. This faster iteration also leads to faster changeover and production scaling. So being able to shift agilely from one task to another, you're not locked down to all of your locked in you know, physical product, Instead, you have a library of parts so you can reduce your inventory overhead and instead print the parts you need when you need them. And that's how you're going to transform your business. But what I want to do real quick is I want to show you one of our customers who is using the MarkForge technology to transform their business so that you can see how they took this step in you know, taking advantage of 3D printing and taking advantage of the MarkForge portfolio to make profit. At Caldwell, we make components that go into windows and doors that are sold around the world. We've used the MarkForge printers to make everything from prototype all the way through low volume production pieces, tools, and fixtures to aid in manufacturing for assembly and or test and measurement. In the past, an engineer would need a part made and I'd have to estimate how long it would take to machine that part. Some of those parts could have 40 hours of machining in them. Today, with the Mark Forge printers, an engineer will give me a drawing, and the first thing that comes to my mind is I want to use the printers. This fixture to machine traditionally would probably cost five times as much and take two weeks to manufacture. I printed it in a day, and they were able to use it that same day. This is a production assembly. This is a prototype assembly using both composite and metal 3D printers. This assembly allows you to tilt your windows in for cleaning. Having the ability to 3D print our own metal components has really improved our development process. The similarities between what we'll print in stainless steel and what we would cast in stainless steel, it's just incredible. That's something we can get in two days in our own lab. The hardware we manufacture is what holds the window together structurally. And if that were to fail, it can mean a severe damage to a building and major disruption for someone's life. The strength of the 3D printed parts that we get off of Mark Forge machines allow us to put those parts through the same set of conditions that we would test a production piece. They're real parts that have actual strength. In this highly competitive world, you need every advantage you can get to produce the parts, do your job, have a leg up on your competition in every single part of the business possible. And 3D printing is huge to help us do that. So 3D printing is an integral part 
of improving your workflows. Uh, so for the example of Caldwell, uh, they're able to cut new product development time from six months to six weeks. So when they want to roll out a project, they're saving that much time. And they also decreased part cost by 10 times, which made it very easy for them to you know, justify the printer. So not only are we talking about huge savings in terms of development time, but you can also have a huge savings in terms of uh, your product diversity. So Dixon Valve, we mentioned them a little bit earlier, and the idea that Dixon Valve needed solved or the challenge that they were facing is their end of arm effectors were so diversified but needed to be strong components. So you couldn't just print them with any of the standard 3D printing methods. And what they did is they were able to take these components, these end of arm effectors, and print them using the reinforcement, which decreased their lead uh, time from two to four weeks to two to three days, saving them about 32 grand per project, which gave them a break-even ROI at 1.5 months, which is just another example of 3D printing improving a business. So the idea that Dixon was able to take, you know, same day iteration for R&D and tooling, they had faster delivery. And on top of that, a lot of places that get these 3D printers especially the Mark IV 3D printers, um, get this culture of rapid innovation. And that idea is that there are so many problems that 3D printers can solve that you know we don't think about. But instead, once you have a 3D printer in-house, once you're kind of working with the, you know, the versatility of the composites or the, uh, the metal printing, you get a bunch of the Hey, can I make this with the 3D printer? Hey, can I, you know, try a quick prototype of what I want to create on a 3D printer? So you get that rapid culture of innovation. Another example in terms of the metal side is Stanley Black and Decker. So Stanley Black and Decker has this device, this machine for driving in posts. It's a post driver. And what we're looking at here is that hydraulic actuator housing. And this component was actually composed of four separate pieces previously. And each of those pieces to, to manufacture was actually quite complicated. So rather than having these components individually separate, instead the components were combined into one and redesigned with the metal printing. And this was able to reduce the weight by 53%. And the, the trick with this post driver is that their mid-size production runs and Stanley Black & Decker guarantees that they'll have parts for you for the upcoming you know, 10 or 15 years. But there's so few of them that it doesn't make sense for them to produce a bunch of the parts in their initial production run. So what we were able to do, what Stanley Black & Decker was able to do was to reduce the initial cost. So for the production run, they brought that down by 42%. But when we're talking about creating parts down the road, so supporting their components, supporting their assemblies, they were able to reduce the cost of those orders by 92%. So taking advantage of the low production volume and high versatility of the 3D printing uh, world, Stanley Black & Decker was able to really turn their, their business around in terms of the specific product. And this brings us to our last topic of the afternoon, and that's the idea of how do you identify an opportunity for 3D printing? What are we looking for? What can you go into your workplace and see to indicate that you should be using a 3D printing solution? And we've kind of boiled it down to three specific ways in order to search for 3D printing opportunities. Uh, the first of which is pain points and cost drivers. So things that are conventionally expensive, we can work to make those much cheaper with 3D printing. Another is just looking at common manufacturing applications where others are using it. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, the common tooling and fixturing materials that we've been successful at replacing in other companies and businesses. So starting off first with the pain points and cost drivers, really we have the opportunity to decrease the amount of unplanned downtime uh, to speed up that line changeover calibration, 
to basically assist with your aftermarket upgrades and, and kind of help with your cardboard engineering. So the unplanned downtime, life happens, parts break, components break, but when the line goes down, you're losing a lot of money. That's not an insubstantial amount. So rather than having to wait for a component that you don't have, you're able to get that line back up and running ASAP and you decrease the impact from failures because any downtime has lost money. If you've had any downtime, 3D printing can help solve that. Speaking of lines, line changeover calibration. So the idea that when you want to shift to making a different product or you're shifting your floor around, a lot of times there's a lot of undocumented parameters, uh, you know, people, oh, uh, Jim knows how to do that. Or, you know, I've always done it this way. And rather than relying on that type of information, you can instead make your different parts with 3D printers. So these black components on these rails are 3D printed components, which are the width of the guide rails, and they position them in the correct location for switching back and forth between two typical changeovers. So rather than spending hours to make this changeover, it only takes a couple of minutes now with this innovation. And that's the benefit, that's what you're looking for in 3D printing, is when you look at something that is highly customized, highly diversified, there's a good chance you can make it better with 3D printing, such as aftermarket upgrades. So a lot of times nowadays we're, we're adding sensors to everything. You need a proc sensor, you need to add vision to your machine. Well, you can create all of your custom brackets, all of your fixturing with 3D printing. So that's going to be able to free up your machines from creating these brackets and free up your machinist time in order to actually create your your value add components. And finally is the idea of like cardboard engineering. And I mean, we've all done it. We've all used the zip ties and the duct tape to make something work for a short amount of time. But this is where 3D printing can be really powerful. So rather than creating a temporary fix where the, you know, the next shift is just gonna have to deal with it when it breaks again, you can create permanent solutions to undocumented problems that will be sustainable. So uh, a part to hold something in place or you know some type of mounting mechanism, all of that can be done via the Markforce 3D printing and can help to kind of justify that printer or at least to get you started with working with the printer. Now, in terms of the common manufacturing applications for 3D printing, these are the locations that we've seen customers be successful in implementing 3D printing. The first of which is the CM, uh, CMM net, uh, Nest and QC. The idea being that, uh, for example, this is a customer, JJ Churchill, and they need to hold parts for planes and they need to inspect those parts for planes. Well, the problem is if you scratch any component, a scratch in aeronautics is going to be an eventual break or fracture, and therefore you need the material properties to hold these these metal components that aren't going to mar the surface. And that's why the custom fixturing is very useful for QC and inspection. Not only QC and inspection, but if you're building assembly fixtures, here is an example of a motor. And while it's sitting on these conformal motor mounts, you'll notice that we could make those components so much faster via 3D printing then you would be able to out of say metal. So in metal, you'd have to go set up a machine, you'd have to create the profile of your, of your motor in order for it to rest on. And you just don't have to go through that much work inside of a 3D printing shop. You are able to simply create the geometry and send it to the slicer and hit print. And now you have something that's not only not going to mar, but it's going to sturdily hold your component while you're working on it. So the idea of work holdings, uh, in this example, here we have a casting and the flash needs to be round off. But the problem is that these aluminum components took not only a couple of weeks in backlog in the machine shop, but also the flash was such a variable thickness that they had to create two, three, four of them in order to correctly hold their components. The solution, this, component is a hybrid of the onyx thermoplastic material. So that's that black 
material that you see there, and common hex stock. So we're using the hex stock here to provide location and anti-wear, but instead of having to wait weeks for metal components to print or more metal components to be subtractively created, I can instead put this on the print bed and have it by the end of the day. We also see this in end of arm tooling. So here, another example in the packing industry is the idea of these vacuum manifolds. And vacuum manifolds are very cool in that they're very customized, but also in this specific instance, they were able to design the channels into the manifold itself, therefore saving a ton of effort on setting up hoses and uh, you know creating this manifold by hand, which is what they would have been doing previously. So just taking uh, additive manufacturing and applying it to what you see could be improved around the shop. Speaking of which, soft dolls and machining fixtures is my personal favorite. The idea that, uh, and these are just Mark Forge soft dolls holding this component, you can replace your fixture drawer with Mark Forge component. So this is a, a basically a fixture for a engine mount that has two machining operations, one on each side, meaning it has to get flipped over. Uh, it's a very custom shape, and the idea is that rather than having a metal one of them, you can make this out of composite material which allows you to do the exact same machining and create the exact same metal part but without ever having to machine the part that's holding it so you're able to just load that on to the software and create your fixturing and holding you didn't have to either a go out back and find the jaw from you know the fixture from 10 years ago or find whatever fixture that you can cut into to make a new fixture for this. Instead, you can just create the part for very cheap. I mean, that part's only a couple dollars and be making your actual part in the same day. Another opportunity we've seen be very successful is welding fixtures. The idea of holding different components at weird angles uh, is perfect application in terms of 3D printing. So being able to set it up so that you're welding your component while it's being held at, you know, a specific, in this case, a, you know, the 45, is somewhere else we've seen 3D printing be very, very successful. So, last but certainly not least, in terms of ways to search for opportunities to work with 3D printing, is looking at common materials that you're you're using. So these are the materials that we found very successful to replace with either composite or composite and metal components. So aluminum, your tooling steels, your carbides, and your nylon, your Teflon, your Delrin. I mean, you're able to, rather than having to machine out these plastics, rather than having to work with some of these metals, we can very successfully replace these with similar material properties with different components. So we're not talking about just replacing your part with a different metal component. We're talking about a much cheaper a much easier to fabricate method. So in this case, replacing a non-marring fixture in a di that's machined in a different plastic with a 3D printed component is a great solution. So Mark Forged enables its customers to produce stronger functional parts. We're not just talking about prototypes uh, that are faster and lower cost for your business. And last but certainly not least, I just wanna point out here that once you have a 3D printer, there the opportunities are endless. So we've all been struggling here with this COVID-19 response. And what we've done with our printers in, at the Solid Experts office in Nashua is we saw an opportunity to actually make uh, PPE or protective masks for hospital. So we have already shipped out over 50 masks and there's 50 more currently being worked on. And the idea here is that once you have these 3D printers, they're really easy to adapt to work with the challenges that your business provides you, or in this case, that the world provides you. So what I wanna do now is I wanna go ahead and open this up for questions. I'll go ahead and turn on the, the webcam here and I'll introduce John Nolan, our uh, senior applications engineer in the Nashua, New Hampshire office, uh, also who is directly working with these, uh, the PPE here. And I'm going to open up for any questions you guys have, if you want to just throw those into the chat. And 
and we'll wrap it up. So I'll give everyone a few minutes to write out their questions. See what people got. All right. Looks like uh, looks like there's no questions. But if you run into anything, please feel free to reach out. Uh, the contact information is all set out via the GoToWebinar, and uh, we'll hope to answer your questions. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great afternoon.